Uh, good afternoon and welcome to IISS. My name is Nigel Inkster. I'm the Director for Transnational Threats and Political Risk here at the Institute and uh, it's my pleasure to be uh, chairing uh, this um, session on the topic of the myth of the Taliban-Al-Qaeda uh, merger. This is a topic, you know, the relationship between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, which of course is uh, very topical and very salient at the moment. The reason that uh, the USA and its NATO ISAF allies went into Afghanistan in 2001 was precisely to ensure that Afghanistan could not in the future become a safe haven for transnational terrorist groups uh, looking to launch attacks uh, against the West and, and Western interests. And that remains uh, one of the key drivers for the way in which this whole mission uh, has played out and, and, and will evolve. And the key um, academic question, is, uh, uh, the key question um, is the extent to which uh, a US uh, NATO ISAF withdrawal from Afghanistan could translate into uh, a repeat of the status quo anti 9-11. Um, um, at the time of 9-11, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, there was a widespread consensus, and I certainly would have uh, shared that consensus at the time, that uh, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda had indeed entered into what could at the very least be characterized as a partnership, if not an alliance. But uh, since that time, a lot of new information has come to light, which has uh, um, um, presented a rather different picture of the way that uh, relationship uh, evolved. And more recently, of course, it's been possible to uh, monitor further the evolution of uh, Taliban thinking in, in relation to all of this. And our two speakers today, Felix Kuhn and Alex Strick van Linschotten, uh, are particularly well qualified to address this topic, having spent the last five years engaging in field research in Kandahar, which I think it's fair to characterize as the spiritual home of the um, Taliban movement. Uh, and in the course of this, they have uh, um, read a great deal of literature, spoken to a great deal of people, and been able to draw some um, uh, interesting conclusions about uh, what the relationship between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda now consists of. This is not a, a book launch as such, but it's worth pointing out that the, uh, our two speakers have just uh, uh, published uh, a book on this subject with the title An Enemy We Created, um, and I'm sure those of you who have a wider interest might uh, want to acquire copies of that at some time, point. But um, at this stage, I'd like to turn over to our two speakers who will talk for somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes on the subject at the end of which time uh, we will have an opportunity for questions and discussion. So, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael. Yeah, thank you for this introduction. Um, what we're going to try to do here in the next 20 minutes is highlight a couple of the things from the research we've done for this book uh, and we, we created. Um, as you can see, it's concerned with the relationship of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. But what it actually does, it reaches far beyond that and looks at the origin of the individuals which came to form these groups, their ideology and their socioeconomic background in a lot of ways. Um, so let's just jump into this. Um, we're both going to talk a little bit here and there about a couple of things we felt uh, came out of this research um, from a lot of interviews we did and, and, and sources we accessed. Um, and yeah, let's just share that with you. The book starts um, right at the beginning of the story, in fact, possibly <coughs> before the story, story started. Um, uh, we uh, thought it was important to, in terms of the relationship between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda to start thinking about ideological similarities and differences. Um, uh, and you, know, you need to go all the way back to 1960 and 1970 when all of these people were 
studying um, uh, at the time. Um, here you can see a picture of the White Mosque uh, in Western Kandahar in Maiwan district, which is the, the original uh, location of, 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 of essentially of the, the, the flowering of the Taliban in, in 1994. Um, uh, this was the mosque at which Mullah Muhammad Omar taught um, during the late 80s and early 90s uh, and is where the initial discussions over the formation of the Taliban movement um, were held. Uh, and as you can see, it's you know, quite, a, quite an old building. Um, uh, and in many ways, it kind of represents the, the very uh, localized and fixed nature of, um, uh, of these, uh, these people who, who then came to, together in, uh, to form the Taliban movement. Um, uh, they, uh, you know, in terms of their their origins, their socioeconomic background, their their education, it was quite um, quite a limited um, uh, scope or limited field um, in many ways. Um, uh, the world they they grew up in was was um, uh, one in which they they wouldn't have known they didn't know too much about uh, about what was going on in in other countries. Um, Kandahar, for example, only had two newspapers. Um, uh, at the time, which were distributed to, to a couple of hundred um, individuals, mostly working for the government, and you know there was one radio station which mostly played music. Um, so people living in the villages and, and, and uh, who were uh, engaged in the <coughs> madrasa education, uh, as, as the Talibs were, um, uh, they had very little concept of the kind of the wider world uh, around them. Um, they come, of course, from from a Hanafi tradition. Um, specifically um, uh, relating to, to, to that which developed from, from the Deobandi school. Um, uh, there's a lot which is, is, is written about that. We, we often tend to forget uh, a number of kind of other um, uh, follow-ons from that and that um, uh, from, from the Deobandis uh, as part of this, as it was originally conceived, there was a, always strong ties with, uh, <coughs> with Sufism and Sufi principles. <coughs> So from that you have ideas of authority and you have the, the concept of the peer and the murid or the, the follower and the disciple, which was very important to, to how, the, how the Taliban um, uh, kind of functioned later on in, in terms of uh, people respecting orders from, from more senior leaders. Um, uh, and uh, in, in, you know, in this, this, this Deobandi um, <coughs> religious heritage, which, which they uh, inherited and were educated in, um, was uh, a very kind of literalist reading uh, of, um, uh, of, 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 of the Quran and the Hadith literature, um, uh, and uh, there was very little um, uh, outside this. There was certainly no kind of uh, wider globalist agenda or anything um, that, 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 that Felix will, will come to talk about. So, I mean, in, in many ways, uh, it was a... Um, uh, yeah, it was a, a group of very young people at this time with very little experience of the world um, uh, and, 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 and living in, 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 in these kind of isolated locations. Um, Al-Qaeda, on the other hand, was a very different organization. This is one of many maps we created um, to map out individuals and organizations in the wider world of uh, the global jihadist movements and how they related to individuals and the Taliban. Um, this is a fairly confusing one. Um, uh, that just to say, this is, uh, represents various countries and individuals who moved about the world. Um, and if you look into Al Qaeda, and this is where looking at the origins of these these, these people who came to form these uh, um, organizations is so important to understand how they operate today. Um, for starters, they were essentially from a different generation. Uh, everyone who came to be in Al-Qaeda was more or less 10 years older than the Taliban senior leadership. Um, that's quite important if you, in the local uh, cultural context when you would imagine a meeting between the senior Taliban leadership and the senior uh, members of Al-Qaeda. Um, it's, it's a very different meeting if there is a 10 year age gap. Um, most of the individuals of, uh, who came to, um, to, to, to form Al-Qaeda held um, university degrees uh, in secular science. There were engineers, architects, doctors. Um, hardly any one of them had a religious education. Um, the kind of background they grew up in, like going to school and, and growing up in the Middle East, also presented a very, very different experience. Uh, at the time, there had been multiple big uh, experiments such as pan-Arabism, pan-Islamism played out, and most of them had been engaged in, uh, in, in, in violence or in warfare against their home governments. Uh, like in Egypt, uh, 
Syria and in other places before they actually came to Afghanistan and joined the jihad there in the 1980s. Uh, there's a lot of concepts which came out of these, these earlier experiences in their home countries, uh, you know, by, by prominent thinkers such as Saeed Qutub, uh, the, the concept of takfirism, for example, where you excommunicate and fight against another Muslim um, is key to understand a lot of what happened to this jihadist universe uh, and Al-Qaeda in specific. Um, in general, Al-Qaeda and from the heritage from where they came from saw itself in a very different conflict and does still this very point. The Afghan Taliban um, have been a very nationalist outlook and that's sort of like when you see the two pictures <coughs> which we showed here, like the mosque uh, in rural Afghanistan, and this picture kind of like comes to play. Um, the Afghan Taliban, till this day, are very much concerned with Afghanistan. Uh, their insurgency has a very nationalistic touch. Uh, there's been any, hardly any instance where like an Afghan or an Afghan Talib has been involved in uh, an operation outside of Afghanistan. Um, Al-Qaeda, on the other hand, sees itself in the globalist struggle. There is the idea of the near and the far enemy, the home governments in various, in the Middle East, um, as well as what they saw as the primary um, supporter in the United States of America and other Western governments. So uh, that is sort of, sort of like something which hasn't really changed. One of the key things that we um, uh, sought to understand during our research for, uh, for this book um, was the re personal relationship between Mullah Muhammad Omar and Osama bin Laden. Of course, in the... Uh, popular conception in, in, in the secondary literature which exists, um, some of which was written before 9-11, but most of which was written after. Um, uh, th this image is, is, is uh, created or, or kind of conjured in a way um, of um, uh, Mullah Muhammad Omar and Bin Laden um, essentially spending a lot of time together um, uh, living in, um, uh, in Kandahar, discussing things, making plans. Um, actually, when you know when we came to look at um, what facts there were in terms of uh, in terms of the relationship, firstly, the information was uh, quite restricted. Uh, when it came down to to the accounts of the relationship between these two leaders, um, the primary sources which everyone re referred to uh, amounted to about nine or ten documents, some of which were only one or two pages long. So, not much information um, and a lot of speculation on the basis of that. Um, uh, and secondly, we, you know, we, we uh, came upon uh, a number of kind of uh, facts which, which weren't part of this literature. For example, the fact that Osama bin Laden didn't speak Pashto, he didn't speak Mullah Omar's language. Um, uh, this was quite an important point, we thought, in terms of you know, the relationship between, between the two. Um, secondly, we, you know, we also, um, uh, from, from, from what, what we could glean from, from the sources and interviews and people who were involved, the two didn't actually seem to have spent that much time together. Um, the, the, most, the most that people would, would go towards is, is saying maybe they met once every few months. Um, and, and a lot of people said they didn't even meet that, that, that often either. Um, so uh, you know, we, we tried to, to present um, uh, a number of different um, new perspectives um, on, on, on exactly how, how this, this personal relationship uh, existed. Of course, the relationship between the two wasn't uh, just um, a product of, uh, of these personal relations, but it was uh, also sometimes a product of uh, external forces, um, particularly the international engagement with Afghanistan, uh, which goes, I guess, to, 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 the, ti to the title uh, in some ways of, uh, of the book, An Enemy We Created. So the external forces acting on, on the Taliban uh, often produced certain, um, uh, certain reactions and responses. Um, so in particularly um, in August 1998, uh, U.S. cruise missile strikes on Afghanistan and Sudan, um, uh, which were, uh, in our analysis, quite instrumental in terms of tipping Mullah Omar uh, into a more uh, belligerent position against the international community. Um, uh, and possibly, uh, although the evidence for this is, is not really existent, possibly uh, cementing closer, closer personal relationship with bin Laden, um, or for example, the uh, UN sanctions regime, which was imposed in 1999, um, then saw in January 2000 the Taliban inviting the Chechen delegation who'd been knocking at the Taliban's doors for, for a few years and invited them and officially granted them uh, Taliban recognition as a response to, to the UN uh, provocation in their eyes. Um, 
And, uh, this is a, a, a picture of, of a painting on the side of a Hamli of the World Trade Center, as you can see. Um, the World Trade, um, the 9-11 attacks really have been a watershed in a lot, great many ways, specifically in, in, in the reactions by the United States and others. Um, as Nigel said in his introduction, you know, uh, in 2001, a lot of the, many people would talk about the nexus and how like Taliban and Al-Qaeda really was, you know, group closely cooperating. Um, you know, these ideas really were formed in the immediate aftermath, uh, like uh, as early as like the 12th of September, I believe, like George Tenet, um, the head of the CIA back then, uh, said in a security meeting, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda really essentially are the same. Um, what happened uh, in terms of the wider universe uh, of, of jihad, jihadism uh, uh, in terms of the reaction is Al-Qaeda throughout the 1990s was a really small group amongst many, many different groups and individuals. Uh, within Afghanistan there were multiple commanders, there were multiple groups uh, who had training camps, who would train, who would fight for various ends and had different ideologies at times. Um, and Al-Qaeda had always been struggling to consolidate all these groups under their leadership and convince them to join them in their war effort uh, and, and follow their, their ideology. Uh, the reaction to 9-11 had, uh, in that way, a really beneficial effect on Al-Qaeda and its leadership because all of a sudden we see a greater dichotomy evolving. Uh, a lot of these individuals who did not sign up throughout the 1990s, and it's, it's really prominent people like Zakawi, who we came to know as the head of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, uh, he was an independent uh, uh, man through, uh, in the late 1990s, had his own training camp, uh, and was invited multiple times back then by Osama bin Laden to join him, uh, and said no on all these occasions. That changed after 9-11, uh, just because the, the kind of like the doctrine that was applied by the United States in a way kind of like painted a lot of people onto the same page, which essentially were not on the same page. Uh, there were other instances like Khattab, uh, a prominent uh, jihadist leader in Chechnya, um, who throughout the 1990s was very independent, didn't, wasn't on good terms with Osama bin Laden at all. Um, big conflict, actually. Uh, who, after 9-11, started to reach out to Osama bin Laden and try to get more contact to these groups. Um, as for the Taliban and the immediate um, fallout of uh, the launch of Operation Enduring Freedom in uh, October 2001, Al-Qaeda in a lot of senses was far better prepared for what was coming. Um, and what we've seen developing over the next, or the first half of the last, de uh, of the last decade is a great expansion of Al-Qaeda. Um, all of a sudden we see franchises and branches developing um, throughout the Middle East and a greater sign up in a lot of ways, as I just lined out, of many prominent individuals. The Taliban really found themselves in a very different position. Uh, their organization was essentially destroyed. Um, uh, while a lot of the leadership managed to cross the border, um, there was nothing to, in, our, in, in forms of planning ahead or seeing that coming at all. Um, so they really found themselves in different positions in terms of their preparedness. And it took the Taliban a good, good amount of time uh, and uh, us a lot of mistakes in order to to, to see the reemergence of them um, in, in 2003. Um, that being said, as we lined out a couple of these things over, the, over like the 1990s, uh, both of these entities are not static, right? The Taliban have undergone a great evolution since they came from the small little madrasa in Maiwand to capture Kabul, run the country, and then being ousted again and starting an insurgency. Um, and this is what Alex is going to talk a little bit. Little bit. The Taliban have changed a lot since 2001, and the reincarnation we're seeing today might not be the same as we had it in the 1990s. Uh, <coughs> I wanted to to skip skip ahead right to the end of the story, I guess. Um, uh, in the book, where we kind of outlined some of the the emergence of of, of these trends that, that I'll talk about, but I would argue since since we finished it in in what October 2010. Um, uh, a lot of things have happened uh, since then. Um, but uh, uh, in particular, um, uh, we have this, this emergence of, of, of a new generation of, uh, of leaders and of commanders within the Taliban, um, which um, um, uh, come about in part um, uh, as, a, as a response, um, or sorry, in, 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 uh, uh, in reaction to, to, um, to the night raids um, campaign, the targeting campaign, uh, which international forces have been conducting in Afghanistan. So you have a lot of 
uh, a lot of commanders being captured or killed by ISAF, NATO, various special operations groups, um, and you have a group of people coming in to replace them uh, uh, who are younger, um, who um, uh, may not even remember an Afghanistan that was ever at peace, um, who were educated um, uh, in uh, a more um, uh, ideologically um, charged atmosphere, you could say, um, uh, and, and who who often come with, with a different, um, uh, a different uh, outlook uh, on, on where they see the war and, and what they see it's, uh, uh, it being about. Um, increasingly, you have people, um, these, these younger commanders, who are willing to accept the possibility of, you know, once we take Afghanistan, then we'll take the rest of the world. Um, uh, you hear things like that from, from some of the younger generation. Uh, part of it also is increasing financial independence of these younger commanders, <coughs> mid-level commanders. Um, this comes in part from uh, from NATO. From you know, they tax a local construction project which is happening in um, uh, in areas under their control. Um, and a lot of them have become quite wealthy of this. So they they have no need. Um, they're not getting anything in, in you know from from the sanctuary in Pakistan, uh, essentially apart from you know orders and directives. So they will say, you know, um, I'm the one fighting here. I'm generating my own money. I'll, I'll make my own decisions. Um, and you know we've seen instances um, of Al Qaeda and associated groups taking advantage of this, sending people in to spend time with these younger commanders, this this newer generation, um, to uh, not not with any overt um, mission, but just you know uh, socialising themselves, um, making friends, uh, offering support when you know when when support is needed. Um, this has some tactical implications. Um, uh, most of which you, know, you can see in this in this photo is a suicide attack in uh, in Kabul. Um, uh, uh, you have you have the increasing adoption of these kinds of tactics, um, which were pretty controversial when they started to be used back in 2005. In terms of uh, within the Taliban, uh, there were extensive debates, many of which are still uh, ongoing over the religious legitimacy um, uh, of. Uh, of using these, as well as the, the military uh, utility for the movement, um, uh, and you know the kind of coordinated complex attacks, um, uh, which which we have seen much more of uh, in recent years, are also a, a product of this. There are also some strategic implications for for the Taliban, of course. Um, uh, the senior leadership started to have um, uh, essentially kind of command and control issues um, over the younger commanders, so. The, older generation living uh, based mostly in, in Pakistan, most of which are in, in, in Karachi, um, uh, losing control um, of, of their commanders on the ground. Um, this, of course, feeds into the whole narrative of negotiations, peace talks. Um, uh, if, if the senior leadership no longer have control over the movement, what is the point in talking to this older generation anyway? Um, there's, there's, there's still a kind of question mark over this. Um, and you know we have a possible generation, um, a creation of Afghans uh, who are interested in attacking global targets. Whereas in the past, there has never been um, uh, an instance, apart from two people who are kind of exceptions, uh, never been uh, instances of Afghans engaging in global um, uh, operations. But uh, increasingly, that, that, that might be a possibility um, for the future. Um, and all of this, I guess, feeds into to, to a kind of general theme in the book of unintended consequences of international intervention, international actions within Afghanistan, um, where we do one thing and we expect one result, but then something else happens as well, which we hadn't anticipated, um, which is kind of clouding the, clouding the waters and making it more difficult to, uh, to engage the Taliban as a movement uh, in a meaningful way. Um, there's obviously a great many things we didn't talk about, uh, probably a few which are very essential, which I hope come up. Uh, in the question and answer session. Um, one of them would be, for example, that the relationship throughout the 1990s was very strained and they didn't really get along, like to the extent that we had, you know, the Taliban having to intervene uh, with, with actions of, of people associated with Al Qaeda in, uh, interfering in local communities and so forth. A um, little bit self promotion, this is obviously the, the things we've been working with later this year is going to come out of Poetry of the Taliban, which is a collective collection of, uh, of poems, which for a lot of people is very strange, but it's actually going to be, I think, a very, very interesting volume, given that it's going to be 
a very different outlook on who these people are, uh, what, what a Taliban fighter thinks about, um, since it's an uncensored and, and very personal way of, of how they engage with their warfare. Um, that being said, 20 minutes, 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> yeah, all right. Thank you very much. And, uh, I hope we address some of the things in the question and answer session. Thank you, thank you very much. I think your comment, uh, your observations about poetry are actually very pertinent, and I think you know, this is true in a wider context. One of the things that we tend to see when, when, when the Western media presents um, jihadists uh, putting across their message, you know, what, what we tend to see is an angry man having a rant, um, which doesn't you know, particularly resonate with uh, you know, Western audiences. What is stripped out of that, because it's not seen as uh, um, suitable for Western uh, uh, news environment, is all the preparatory work that leads up to this rant, which includes a lot of poetry, music, uh, and you know, so if you like, warm-up acts, um, warm-up acts by other, other speakers that uh, lead you through you know, a kind of cultural and intellectual process towards what uh, the main speaker is going to say. So um, in this context, I think uh, an issue like poetry is particularly uh, relevant. I, 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 for one, look forward to that, uh, that volume coming out. Well, we've got about uh, half an hour for questions and comments, so I'll open the floor. Um, Alex Nickel in the penultimate row. Uh, thanks very much. That was absolutely uh, fascinating. Um, I wonder if you could carry forward your remarks to talk a little bit about the prospects for Western negotiations, discussions, whatever, with the Taliban um, in general, but also specifically in light of what you said, is there any way for Western negotiators to have any confidence that the interlocutors that they have have any means of actually executing whatever it is they undertake to do in any such talks? Um, is this? Yeah, it's on. It's on. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think the, the, the ah, it's on now. Um, I think that you know the issue of, of, of negotiations is is an interesting one. You say you know what confidence can we have um, in Taliban being able to deliver on um, on their uh, promises and, and whatever might might come at the end of this. Um, Part of the answer of that is, you know, the proof is in the pudding, um, and we will only see once we actually try. So far, we have never actually tried to engage them on uh, on this issue. Um, another thing comes that, you know, uh, even on this this issue of the relationship between the Taliban and Al Qaeda, uh, it's often said that you know one of the Western um, preconditions or strong desires out of out of a negotiations process. Uh, possibly even in the short term, uh, will be some kind of statement from the Taliban that they um, uh, that they stand against and, uh, and that they condemn international terrorism. Uh, I'm not so sure how useful that is or, or uh, meaningful that is. I mean, you know, you can you can issue a, a hundred statements, and you know, the people who don't believe that the Taliban would hold by such an agreement, they wouldn't be convinced by a statement saying that you know we're we're, we're announcing terrorism. So I mean, a lot of things will have to come. Uh, afterwards, and will will only be be evident um, afterwards. That said, you know um, uh, we have seen some positive developments in that we now have uh, a credible group of people um, based uh, in Qatar um, who have a direct line to Mullah Muhammad Omar, and they have, they're close to that senior leadership. And it's 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 the real deal in terms of you know you couldn't have a better group of people to to represent this this old generation leadership. Um, uh, uh, and you know that's that's a very positive step, um, but these dynamics of of fragmentation of um, uh, quarrels and, and, and conflict within the senior le within both within the senior leadership and between the senior leadership and the middle level leadership that to some extent depends on you know how much we continue to dismantle the Taliban's leadership structures, which is what we're doing at the moment in in terms of the military tactics. Um. Yeah, I just would want to add, which is probably not that much about the Taliban or, or the efforts being made. I think there is a great role for like diplomats in this. Um, I think what we're seeing right now is a little bit s too single-minded. Uh, I think a, a, a negotiated settlement or a settlement of any form uh, 
includes far more than just the Taliban and whatever counterpart. Uh, the Afghan government is not representing the rest of Afghanistan. Uh, the rest of Afghanistan is represented by various fractions which have been preparing for what comes next, um, specifically, you know, former and current member of, of what we like to call the Northern Alliance. Um, and I think uh, uh, we need to, there, there needs to be a great effort um, in order to open up that negotiations process and ensure that we have these people at the table. Um, because a quick fix was just the Taliban leadership, even, you know, like right now, you know, if I would point to a number, I would probably assume that they would be able to pull 75% at the least of like the Taliban insurgency behind them. That there is going to be a fraction that continues fighting, I think is something nobody has a doubt about. There's multiple groups which have been um, aligning themselves with, with, with other far more radical uh, uh, groups in, in, in Pakistan. But, you know, uh, uh, political settlement uh, to, the, to the current conflict really needs to include the individual actors. And that's something really people need to push for, not a quick fix. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, the lady in the third row there. Uh, could, could you please say who you are, if I don't already know who you are? <laughs> you wouldn't know me. I'm a, a graduate student at the LSC, and uh, this is a really fascinating talk. And I actually did want to follow up on, on your poetry book, just what kind of um, poems, I mean, what, what kind of stuff is it, is it going to consist of, and how did you come up with that idea, and, and what, um, you know, what do you hope to, it will accomplish? Thank you. Um, I, I start how we came up with the idea. <laughs> um, I think the, the uh, yeah, I, as usual, I think we stumbled up on it. Um, we did this project called Afghan Wire, which was a media monitoring service we had um, set up in, in, in Afghanistan where we looked at various media outlets and sources. And one of the things we started to monitor back then was the, uh, the Taliban's websites and outputs and various other forms. Um, and, you know, there's a really big section devoted to poetry in, in like the media the media side of the Taliban, there is like a dedicated poetry section on the website and so forth. Um, and then once we moved down to Kandahar, I think there was another impetus of that all of a sudden, you know, these poems are being sung. So it's, it's actually poetry which is being sung and you, you would buy it on tapes and CDs and people would have it on their cell phones. So it, and it doesn't really matter whether or not you like the Taliban, you will always like their poetry. Um, a lot of our friends who've been in prison during the Taliban regime who fight against them, they still listen to the poetry because it's, it, it resonates in, with, with their culture and their heritage so strongly. And so we just we started to gather them, actually, because we found it so interesting that it's, it's a great output and it's completely neglected. Everything else gets like analyzed, scrutinized, translated by multiple outlets, you know, every word taken a piece apart, but like, you know, go online and try to look for a translation of, an, of a Talib poem. And, and, and for us, it just became, uh, we, we started to have hundreds of them, and, and uh, we're looking for a home for them. And, and we thought it's, it's interesting just because it gives you a completely different access point. It's, you know, it's really the, you know, Alex is going to talk a little bit about the subject, but it really is you get to know people and not the enemy. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 it's a wide variety of, of subject matter explored um, in the poetry. It's not just the usual things that you would assume, kind of war chants, battle chants, jihad, jihad. Um, uh, yeah, there is some of this. Um, uh, and, you know, you could say maybe 50 or 60% could be kind of called overtly political in some ways. Um, but, you know, there, there's a lot of poetry about flowers and gardens. There's uh, poetry about, you know, discourses on religion. Um, uh, there's reflections of the reality of the war for people who live in the villages. Um, a lot of kind of um, uh, kind of heightened reportage of uh, what it's like to um, uh, have a night raid happen in your house, um, uh, funerals in people's villages, uh, deaths of relatives, um, uh, all of these kinds of things. I mean, I, I found it quite quite interesting to read. Uh, another book which came out recently called um, Heroes, which is a collect anthology of poems written by British soldiers serving in the field in, in Helmand and, and their relatives. Um, and you know, there was quite a substantial overlap between the, the, the themes and the kinds of things and the concerns that the poets had, both in, from the Taliban side and the British Army side. Um, uh, quite, quite a kind of remarkable convergence there. Um, 
And in, it's the, the poems are the only part of the Taliban's um, website which don't pass through a formal censorship process. The statements and so on, all of this gets drafted by committee. Um, even Mullah Muhammad Omar's letter is passed through a kind of uh, circle of people who then kind of edit and add things onto it. Poetry is the only thing uh, which doesn't have some kind of editorial um, uh, overlap um, onto it. Um, and so, you know, they even post poems by former communists um, and uh, people who are opposed to them and so on. There's, there's a kind of rich kind of cultural aesthetic part of, uh, of who they are that, that we wanted to, to, to bring out. Okay, I'll take the gentleman in the back row on my right, please. Back, back row, in my oh, back row on my right, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm Omar from uh, Pakistan. I work in Pakistan High Commission. Uh, you have amply explained the relation between Taliban and uh, Al-Qaeda. How would you explain the relation between uh, Taliban, Al-Qaeda and Mujahideen, the Mujahideen which were created at the time of Cold War? <laughs> and uh, because the mere word Mujahid signifies something which is something very pious, something which is done for a very noble cause or something. So how do you explain the relation between these two things? Thank like, you. Uh, you're talking about like what, what did the Taliban do during the 1980s, Jihad? Um, we actually did a substantial work into this. Oh. Sorry, I don't want to ask that what the Taliban did in 1980s. What I want to understand is that uh, this term Mujahid yeah. was, the, was the term which was used for Taliban in the time when they were fighting the Russians. Yes. Which merely this term signifies something else. What the Taliban now signifies is totally different. So how do you explain this Not relation? Them, but yeah. I, mean, I don't think it, I don't I, I, I think most Taliban right now would consider themselves to be mujahid as in you know engaged in a jihad um, so and they, and they use their words word in the statements and in fact in since mm. since 2005 2006 there was a kind of a rebranding where whereby they would start using this word a lot more in fact you see it in, in the poetry as well the, the word Talib comes up I think once in the entire 270 poems we have in the collection uh, the other times they, <coughs> they use the word Ghazi kind of a holy warrior um, uh, uh, or, or, or mujahid or, or various other terms like this. Um, so I mean, uh, in many ways, you know, they, they try and use it as a word to imply their connection to, um, uh, to others um, uh, fighting in Afghanistan who maybe weren't educated in religious ceremonies but who did fight against the Soviets um, to imply kind of sor solidarity um, with them. And of course, there is a very big debate in Afghanistan as to who gets to call themselves a mujahid, who doesn't. Um, that's, that, that's an ongoing debate um, contested by every single uh, actor out there, but I mean, the, the Taliban still, still would consider themselves uh, mujahideen. Okay, um, we take uh, Ben Barry next, please, in the front row. So. I'm, I'm from the Institute. A um, couple of questions. Firstly, a recently leaked document um, based on thousands of prisoner interrogations by NATO and the US uh, seemed to imply that the Taliban at the moment were very dismissive of al-Qaeda's military capability, that it had reduced quite considerably and the individuals were far less competent. Bearing in mind the dangers of relying just on interrogations from people you captured as a source, I wondered if you had, had an assessment of that. And more broadly, with regard to the Taliban, to what extent do you think they're under meaningful military pressure at the moment? Um, just, just, just to start, I mean, just to add a kind of bit of context, the report which, um, which came out of, out of the UN on the relationship between the Taliban uh, and Al-Qaeda, which was released uh, a couple of days ago, um, you know, characterized it as an atmosphere of general promiscuity in terms of the, 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 the relationships between, between the different groups, but also stated um, you know, for example, there does not appear to be any significant relationship between the Taliban and Lashkar-e Taiba uh, in the senior, senior leadership ranks. I mean, uh, um, uh, the, 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 whatever the reality of the perception, and you know, most Afghans fighting in Afghanistan will not have any contact with foreign fighters. The presence of, of, of foreign fighters fighting in Afghanistan is being greatly exaggerated, and the, the, the numbers, um, uh, the numbers quoted often include, you know, Pakistanis, as does this UN report. It gives, us, gives figures of, of the numbers of foreign fighters, but it includes Pakistanis. And then when you, when you uh, say, you know, well, how many, what percentage of these foreign fighters were, were, were Pakistanis, they will say 
means these you know hundreds of foreign fighters fighting all over all over Afghanistan a bit kind of disingenuous. Um, yeah, uh, I mean that that Al Qaeda's operational capabilities when in Afghanistan are very very minor. Yes, absolutely have been for for ages. Um, they have been focusing on completely different areas uh, since since 2001, and, like, and that that they have lost a couple of their their, their key their key members uh, who had great great skill set um, developed over decades. You know, and, and other people in that in that you know, Elias Kashmiri is a huge loss mm -hmm. for for the general universe of jihadism in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and beyond. I would say, like this, he was like a central hub. Um, but yeah, I mean, like meaningful pressure. I think, you know, like the report said, you know, we are winning and uh, we're always going to win, which is what the Taliban will always say. As I said, you know, they see themselves in, the, in a religious war. Um, uh, the, the, this means more to them than you know, like they, they believe this is like the, the holy path. So they will would, would say they're not under meaningful pressure, and of course they will prevail, no matter what the situation is like. Um, uh, I think the the, the problem. Um, and, and if you look into like the military campaign on the Taliban and uh, over the couple last couple of years, or like let's say since McChrystal came, um, where we then saw a, a very an over reliance maybe on like night raids and, and, and taking out uh, uh, leadership members, uh, I think what we've been seeing is not a demise of the insurgency. What we've been seeing is a demise of the leadership, which is you know if you really understand of the composite of the Taliban. Uh, the way you have to picture this is like, you know, you have like hundreds or even thousands of small groups who all do their independent thing. And on top of this, you have the Taliban leadership who try to enforce a chain of command, which isn't very chainy of commandy because it's very kind of confused. Um, so what ha has happened, they have started to attack this chain of command, which really sits more on top on this diverse group of people fighting. Um, and as Alex has pointed out, you know, a lot of them have reached uh, financial independence. All the services you need in order to, to have warfare, right? Like uh, material, weapons, money laundering, all, the, all these things uh, uh, are mostly uh, services done by independent operators that have nothing to do with the insurgency, they're just businessmen. Um, so, uh, yeah, we see a lack of coordination while we haven't really seen the demise of the insurgency at large. Um, and a lot of these groups have developed local skills with the input of the leadership and others um, to see in, you know, how they're going to operate in terms of their strategy. But you know, there, there is a discussion we had around that. Okay, uh, second row, uh, Dr. Munir. Um, and then, and then uh, thank uh, you, Nigel. Uh, uh, the fourth row after that. Uh, Munir Majid, I'm from LSE Ideas. Now, from, from what you've been able to piece together, and I would imagine a lot depends on your sources and methodology, uh, what would you say was the level of, of, of support there was for Al Qaeda from the Taliban? You know, were they fully supportive of the Taliban? Uh, I mean, were Taliban fully supportive of the Al Qaeda intentions? If the relationship was not close, they didn't know the intentions apart from well, providing. Are we talking about boat? the 1990s? Yes. Or are we talking about How close were they? How supportive were they? Pre-2001, mm -hmm. right. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 um, at least from, from, from our, our, our interviews and from, from sources, uh, uh, both from within Al-Qaeda um, uh, and, and within the Taliban, as well as kind of quite an extensive secondary literature, um, uh, we identified more conflict, in fact, than coherence. Um, uh, between between the two groups, starting from very you know practical things like them being based in completely different places, um, not sharing physical locations, um, then moving on to kind of ideological differences, where you know uh, there are a number of instances where members of Al Qaeda, um, as, as a kind of catch-all term, uh, would um, you know go into a, a cemetery and smash all the gravestones, uh, which then caused you know a massive uproar in, in southeast Afghanistan, which then needed to be mediated. Um, in order that the Talibs wouldn't kick these people out, um, uh, to you know the, the consistent efforts by a small, admittedly a small small group of people, but certainly a group of people um, uh, who uh, sought to um, uh, had a, had a very definite problem and thought that Al Qaeda and the foreign foreigners within Afghanistan during the 1990s were causing more problem, problems than they were worth. 
I mean, certainly the, 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 uh, the expectation from, from Mullah Muhammad Omar, as, as he said sometimes, was, uh, was that, that the foreigners would bring money and investment in Afghanistan. Uh, that never happened. Uh, this was people kind of projecting from the Sudanese experience where bin Laden had built lots of roads. Um, uh, the Taliban received uh, very, very little of this. Um, uh, and uh, the evidence for kind of massive financial uh, input into the Taliban government is is not really there. Um, also, you know, the, the Bin Laden's own financial state um, towards the end of that time was was uh, was pretty shaky. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think it completely depends on how you phrase the question. You know, are the Taliban supportive of a Muslim brother? Yeah, of course they are. If Osama bin Laden is, is, is characterized as somebody who, you know, was fighting alongside him in the 1980s where he brought money and helped him, he's a brother and he needs to be supported. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of religion. Um, are the Taliban supportive of Osama bin Laden's idea to attack the World Trade Center? No, they're not. Not even parts of the Al-Qaeda leadership was in favor of doing that mm. for strategic yeah. reasons. But mm -hmm. again, you know, um, I, I really think it depends on how you frame the question. There, because there is like this intermix of, of you know, the, seeing where the Taliban came from, um, you know, they have far less of like an idea of like splitting off uh, a state, state statesmanship and, and, and uh, diplomacy from, from their religious uh, ideas. I mean, if you, if you see how Mullah Muhammad Omar took decisions throughout the 1990s, it's actually quite an interesting process at times. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's heavily influenced by, by, by his religious, uh, you know, how he would be viewed you know, that he would do anything by the book. And Osama bin Laden in that way, for him, Osama bin Laden was sort of like a bridge to the wider Arab world and the Muslim Ummah, um, because there weren't so many Arabs around. And he was known to be like a, you know, a great man in that sense. So, so um, you know, in, in terms of global jihad, I think there, there's, uh, with the Taliban it's always difficult to dissect this a little bit, because often they make a statement and for the Westerners, something arrives on your side where they say, oh, of course, I support, you know, jihad. Um, but that can mean very different things for them. Um, since a lot of the ideological transfer of like how jihad or the concept of jihad has changed throughout the 1980s um, was like the concept put forward by Abdullah Azam, that transfer hasn't really reached a lot of the Taliban leadership. Otherwise, they would have sent far more troops into the world. Okay, and um, we've got quite a lot of questions uh, uh, pending, so I think we'll take a group of uh, three. Could I please enjoin you to be brief and to uh, end your question with a question mark? Uh, start with Daoud Azami, please, in the fourth row there. Uh, yeah, uh, and then there are um, two ladies uh, in the third row. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'll just make a brief comment, if you allow me, Nigel, and then ask a question. Uh, if it's I mean, brief. I'm sure you, you'll have uh, this in your book, the Taliban inherited Osama bin Laden. He went to Afghanistan before the Taliban captured that part of Afghanistan or before they captured Kabul. So they didn't know Osama bin Laden. Uh, but they allowed him to stay on condition that, they, that, that he wouldn't use Afghanistan against another country. So this was a promise that uh, Osama bin Laden gave to Mullah Omar. And he was not even allowed to uh, give interviews to foreign All media. All of these promises he broke time and mm. time again. And th th yeah, this was the deal between Taliban and uh, Osama bin Laden. And they were not aware of 9-11. Uh, right. No Taliban leader was aware of the planning and execution of 9-11. It was a shock for them as it was for uh, all of us. And uh, most of the Taliban leaders still don't believe that 9-11 uh, was the work of uh, Osama bin Laden, because some, some of them still cannot believe that he could use Afghanistan mm -hmm. to do such a big thing. And uh, they deliberately wanted to keep a distance even after 9-11, even the regime was collapsed. But uh, some commanders uh, became closer to Al-Qaeda. For example, Mullah Dadullah. Then they, the Shura, the Taliban council, wanted to isolate him. They didn't like that. Uh, and then, then he got killed. Then, then he was killed. Mm. Uh, but the question is about Haqqanis, because Haqqanis have Al-Qaeda members with them. They fight together. Uh, they live together. Uh, Al-Qaeda receives uh, maybe expertise and money. Mm. 
So th this this is the question that I okay. have. We'll, we'll take a couple more questions and perhaps we can break them mm. together. The lady in the third row, the two ladies in the third row there, if you could uh, pass the, uh, and, and could you tell us who you are, please? Gabrielle Rifkind, um, I direct the Middle East Programme for Oxford Research Group. Thank you. Um, th thank you for a very, very stimulating talk and a wonderful cover to your book. Um, now, ugh, I have many questions, but the one I want to go back to is the qu question about negotiations. I mean, you said quite clearly that the, the Qataris have managed to pull in high-level Taliban representation. I wanted to um, sort of look at all the other actors who are involved in trying to take initiatives, like the Saudis, and where does it link with the US Pickering Brahimi proposal? But then the question about how far do we need some kind of regional table that pulls in the Pakistanis and the Indians, and how far will a proxy war continue and that actually engaging the Taliban is only a piece of the bigger picture? Okay, thank you. And the other lady in the third row. Thank you. I'm Jenna Khaled, LSE postgrad. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about one of the practical considerations with your poetry book. Uh, concerning intellectual property. Just really curious uh, regarding, um, I mean, are they compensated for the contribution? <laughs> and if, if not, how were you, are you, um, were you able to get them to agree fully? Are they all aware and Okay, right. thank you very much. <laughs> right, okay, well, we've got two uh, sort of policy questions about uh. negotiations and uh, about Haqqani, which is uh, an issue that I might have wanted to raise if nobody else had done, and then the, the, the question about uh, intellectual property. So. I mean, I'll just kick off on the Haqqanis. Um, All right. Are you one? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, you know, the, the Haqqanis in many ways have become um, what, what the, the, the kind of, uh, what we call Talqaeda, this kind of idea of the merger of organizations. The Haqqanis have inherited uh, a lot of this, um, uh, uh, this kind of baggage, um, particularly from perceptions from the West, uh, whereas people more nowadays are more and more willing to accept the possibility that the Taliban and Al-Qaeda are maybe different groups, um, uh, you still have uh, repeatedly this assertion that the Haqqanis and Al-Qaeda are the same thing now. Um, you know, prominent US think tanks will publish papers saying that members of the Haqqani family sit on Al-Qaeda Shura. Uh, it's, just factually speaking, it's not true. Um, uh, I, you know, to some extent, there's a great deal of research which still needs to be done um, outside the kind of the veil of um, polemic. Um, uh, which, which so much of, uh, that, that, that's being written about uh, about about the Haqqanis um, uh, is is kind of consumed with um, going back. Yes, of course, there there, there are interactions and uh, and links and, and, and to a much greater degree than uh, than can be said for for the Taliban. I mean, Jalaluddin Haqqani was working with a, uh, and interacting with a lot of people. These people during uh, during the 1980s. Uh, yet we. Um, often forget the fact that the Haqqanis um, uh, are primarily concerned with their small patch of turf in the south, southeast of Afghanistan, um, uh, and that they have been for, for a very long time, um, uh, you know, repeatedly, pragmatically engaged with um, with politics in Afghanistan, from you know them sending um, uh, the brother of Jalaluddin Haqqani to the Karzai government in 2002 to try and find a way to participate with. Um, with the Afghan government, he was then tortured by the Afghan government uh, and sent back. Um, you know, th there have been a number of cases of kind of attempts at engagement, um, and uh, I mean, yeah, I, I think a lot more work needs to be done to, to tease that out. Um, of course, the, the other side of this, it's not just Al Qaeda; it's it's, it's the Pakistani groups. Uh, and even if Al Qaeda is greatly diminished these days, uh, there are a lot of Pakistani groups um, which are far kind of closer, uh, more closely uh, entwined. Um, uh, with um, with the Haqqani family and the extent to which um, the kind of older generation values of Jaladin Haqqani um, uh, are transferred down to his son Siraj and, and this kind of group, I, I think this is still still a matter of debate. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I have too much to add about this. Um, yeah, as Alex said, I think there needs to be a great amount of work to be done about the Haqqanis. Um, from because yeah, there's the irreconcilables and so forth. I think there's a lot of things that that the Haqqanis have demonstrated to be quite pragmatic in a way, and also as close as their relationship might have been, you know, like post 2001 when like uh, Pakistan needed to demonstrate that they actually like round up these guys, Haqqani would sit with 
all these individuals you point out, you know, in his little house in Wana, and he would get the call from the ISI, and he would pack his bags and leave all the foreigners behind. Mm -hmm. And he would retreat with his men to the mountains, and the guys he was sitting with would get rounded up. That's quite a common occurrence. That was not one time that happened. That happened several times, where he had very little, you know, problems with acting quite pragmatic on that one again. So, uh, you know, there, there, there are, like, a lot of stories out there, um, uh, like, confirmed stories, which, which point to, to quite a different actor than a lot of people think he is. Uh, then there's a lot of, like, external things that happen, right? We uh, appointed, you know, uh, one of his greatest enemies to the same position in the Bonn Conference, uh, in the first Bonn Conference. You know, like, there was very little political room for him to navigate in the first few years. And he did very little. He was sitting in, 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 in Waziristan for two years and kind of, like, waited what's, what's mm -hmm. coming. Um, like, yeah. Do you want to address the subject of negotiations? Uh, on, on, on the regional level, I mean, uh, part of it, um, uh, uh, Saudi Arab Arabia, I kind of dismissed, dismissed this as a bit of a non-event. Um, the Saudis have never really been uh, actively and constructively engaged in... Uh, in this negotiation process. In fact, the only reason why they uh, kind of uh, uh, reached out again and, and Karzai reached out to them and they were willing to be part of this um, is that they felt upstaged by Qatar. Um, and, and that, and, you know, that's that process going on. Um, you talk to any of the interlocutors who were involved between you know, uh, Taliban members, Afghan government, uh, US, um, in terms of the Saudi process, and they would just say, you know, the Saudis aren't interested. They, uh, they won't show up, they won't send, send in important people um, and the Saudis always had this precondition that you know the Taliban must renounce Al Qaeda before we even sit down to the table, which is a complete non-starter. I mean, this, this is one of the key concessions, technically, which the Taliban have to give up. Why would they announce it from from, from the beginning? So, I mean, and, and from from the Taliban perspective, uh, I, I think they and there was a statement released this morning, um, uh, which said exactly this: that you know we've never been contacted by anyone for this new round of Saudi negotiations. We don't recognise it as legitimate. We see it as, you know, engaging with, with, with the Karzai government, which we don't really recognize as existing anyway. Um, so, so Qatar is, is where we put all, put all of our chips, essentially. Um, uh, and, and, you know, um, I think that the, the, the Qatar is, is, is both a good place to do that in terms of that they can bring people who are on various international sanctions in and out freely, whereas Turkey wouldn't have been good because they're signatories to various treaties. Um, and you know, because of the fact that you have real actors involved um, uh, in terms of their, their links back to, to the senior leadership, um, I think uh, you know it's it's, it's potentially a, a could could be a fruitful thing. But it depends how um, uh, how the kind of the, the Western input into that process um, uh, happens. And as, as Felix said earlier, um, you know, the, the, this is just a, a discussion between the Taliban and the U.S. Um, the, the, the kind of the peace process in Afghanistan, whereby you know uh, a lot of kind of conflicts and issues over governance and uh, over culture and uh, all of these kinds of things, sort of none of that is being addressed in Qatar, uh, and I don't yet really see the venue in which that's that's being addressed. I mean, technically, you have the High Peace Council and all of these things, but nothing nothing has really happened on that other more important part of the, the puzzle. I think. I think it's more or less well said. Um, I think I just jumped to like the, the rather interesting question mm. about the, prop the intellectual property rights of the authors of the, <laughs> um, of the poetry, which, which is, a, is a good question. Um, and it's a really, really difficult one, and it, it's an absolute gray zone. Uh, and I tell you, it's probably going to be unsatisfying what I'm going to tell you right now. Um, it starts with how uh, publishing work of fiction or any work uh, in Afghanistan is, where when you're an author, you have to pay for it and you don't get money. Oh, yeah. Uh, we, a lot of our friends like have like multiple books, 12, 13 books they have published, and like you pay for it and you don't get any money. Um, that being said, if you're an author in, 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 in Afghanistan, I'm not saying you know I'm, I'm an Afghan publisher or anything. Um, it's it's very very difficult. Most of these individuals probably couldn't receive money. Um, at least uh, they could never ever receive money in the, from the United States. Um, like we went, you know, like for the Mullah Abdul Salam Zaif. <coughs> When we wrote that with him, uh, he was still on the UN sanctions list. And separated from them, he was also on the terror watch list of the United States of America, which is a different thing. 
since you can get off the UN sanctions list, you can't really get off ever um, from the United States list. Um, so even if, you know, like he, he actually, like he doesn't get any profit from that book. Um, and he signed that with affidavits and we signed that with affidavits and that took about a year. And then the State Department, anyway. Um, mm. It was a really, really long time process. So, um, process. Uh, and e even now he could potentially get money from like, uh, uh, from the Western world except for the United States where he couldn't get any from the United States because of this, these two lists. Um, for like all the individuals who, 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 we, who we put into this volume, um, we try to figure out who they are, um, and they're named as the authors of, of their property, and they're, 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 they're happy to come forward. But like most of them are uh, associated with a group that is in war, so they couldn't receive any funds anyway. Um, if somebody steps forward, I think we would handle it on a one-by-one -one basis, but uh, right now uh, it's, it's, it's also quite difficult, given that a lot of people only use one name, right? This is the poem of Abdullah. Or Mujahid. This is the poem of uh, Abdullah Mujahid. Like you know, and then you can find, you know, can start searching. Um, like we have, for example, uh, uh, sorted through a lot of these um, uh, poems, finding out that it's not a Talib, um, or it's somebody who's actually, you know, who, who, who is, is is a poet, but like he's actually not a Talib, and he's actually well known, and we, you know, and then we made the choice whether or not we, 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 we normally it w we would throw him out then, um, since we wanted to. To get get that really as you know fighting members of the Taliban, full stop. I mean, um, not, we, I mean we not only gathered things which were already existing. In fact, we commissioned a few poems uh, by senior political members of the the, uh, the Taliban's leadership to write poems for the connection as well, um, so that they contributed to that. Okay, well, thank you very much. I see our director of publishing looking quite thoughtful uh, about the Afghan way of uh, publishing. Uh, <laughs> certainly looks to have the potential to be uh, quite profitable from if we were able to introduce it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I fear we've run out of time, so with apologies to those whose questions couldn't be addressed, I, you know, I must bring things to an end. I think you'll agree that our uh, two speakers have shown an impressive uh, um, grasp of um, the detail of this subject, but also an equally impressive ability to situate this within a wider strategic framework, which adds particular value to this exercise. So can I please in invite you to join me in thanking them for their efforts.